The reason it's so hard for you to stay happy is because it's so easy for you to get offended. If you want to make it easier to stay happy, make it harder for you to get offended. So I'm working on this becoming unoffendable project. And I want to invite you in on it because Jesus says that this offense, however it started with your brother and sister, if you entertain it, it, it creates a living hell. It spirals out of control. Things can, sp things can spin out of control so quick you don't even know it's happening. And the enemy's agenda in your life is destruction. Thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. That's John chapter 10, verse 10, note takers. And his agenda is destruction. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. God's a giver, enemy's a taker. He wants to destroy every good thing that God puts in your life. Okay, that's his agenda. His strategy is division. Jesus shared with us in Matthew 12, 25 that a house divided against itself can't stand. Abraham Lincoln didn't say that. Jesus said it. Jesus said that if the enemy wants to destroy your house, the first thing he must do to destroy your house is to divide your house. Are there any newly married couples in church today? Newly married? Why are you clapping for them? They haven't proven anything yet. Is that pity applause? <laughs> newly married couples. Just one more time. I see. I'm saying like maybe like you're, you're newly married. How new? A year. That counts. Would you come on the stage? Do you mind? I don't want to embarrass you in any way. Is your wife here? She's not here. You gotta sit down. <laughs> And you would have been great too. Anybody here with your wife that's newly married and you guys actually made it to church together today? I'm just kidding. I'm sure she's serving in Ikas. Would you? Two, two years? Two years? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, if you don't mind. Come on, let's give them a hand. Come on, guys, give them a hand. This is great. They have no idea what they're getting into. Now, I'm not just going to preach about marriage, Coach Dave, but I figure if I use a marriage illustration to apply to every relationship, keep clapping while they come. Come on, guys, and clap. Uh, your name? Stephanie. Stephanie and Dan. Dan. Good oh, to have you guys. guys. Yeah, yeah, come on all the way up. That'll be great. Let me show you what the devil wants to do in your relationship because God said that the two shall become one. This is exactly what the enemy wants. So every battle you're gonna fight, every argument about the dishes, really, it's a it's the enemy's the enemy's agenda is destruction, and so his strategy is division. And, and the enemy, I don't know if you believe in the devil or not, but the, the enemy, Stephanie's not going to be happy until he sees you like this. And what I just showed you, the Bible says that marriage is even a picture of Christ and the church. So what he wants to do to them, he wants to do to this whole church. And what he wants to do to them, he wants to do to you and your teenager, what he wants to do to them. And, uh, and so his, his agenda is destruction. He comes to kill, still, and destroy. His strategy is division. And here's his tactic, and this is the part I want to preach about. And I appreciate you helping me because you guys are going to help me preach this sermon today. His tactic is offense. Satan has an offensive strategy. Because if he walked up to you… I don't know how I forgot your name already. Tell me one more time. Dan. Dan. Dan the man. Come on, it's Dan the man, everybody. And if the devil were not subtle… Dan wouldn't stand for his schemes, but the enemy is very strategic. And Jesus is giving us, really, in Matthew chapter 5, kind of a playbook of how the enemy wants to work in your relationship. And I know Dan's not going to let him, but he's going to try. Now, he, he won't make an announcement, hey, I'm coming to kill and steal and destroy. You know, because right now you just spend all those money on the flowers and the dresses and all the groomsmen and all that stuff. And I know it's been a couple of years, and that's good because what, what you see in those first couple of years is you see that the enemy will usually start in a small way. Because if he announced, I've come to divide, Dan the man wouldn't stand for that if the devil came in to divide. Come on, stick your chest out, Dan. Dan ain't having it. Dan ain't having it. But if the enemy can just, what, what he'll do, he'll just use the littlest offense. And what Jesus is doing in Matthew chapter 5, he's showing us how to deal with the offense so we can keep the devil on defense. How many want to keep the devil on defense in your life and in your family? Come on, church. 
So, you guys, if you sit back down, I'll, I'll bring you back in a minute, but I don't want you to have to stay up here the whole time. But just stay ready, okay? okay. All right, we're going to come back to here. Last week when I was preaching, I don't know if you remembered, uh, how many of you were here last week? Make some noise. If the person next to you uh, isn't making noise, touch them and say, you really missed it. You really missed it. I ended, remember, talking about, you got this plank in your eye. And you're so concerned about the little speck in my eye. Meanwhile, you're walking around your big old plank, just whap whacking them on the head, just causing distraction, division, and all this stuff. And it's the contrast between the small things and the big things. And there are times that a big offense, I mean, I, there's not a week that goes by. Holly, would you agree that somebody doesn't call me for counsel that's going through a, a marriage situation like a divorce, a separation? Buck, is this true? It's not a week that goes by. It would be another pastor or maybe a situation in the church. And I get to talking to them about what happened. And if you can go back far enough, you find that every plank is made up of a lot of specks. And, and to me, that's the heart of Jesus' teaching. I, re I really didn't read you the whole passage because I want to break it down and, and show you how it happens. He said it could be something as small as a word. Now, write this down. The closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity. And that goes both ways. The closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity for intimacy. However, the closer the relationship, the greater the opportunity for offense. That's why nobody can make you really mad like somebody that you really love. Really. Nobody can hurt you like somebody that you've given your heart to. No, nobody. And I've asked the question a lot of times of, of people, and really in my own mind, I've, I've seen people that were so loyal to each other. And if you would have asked me 10 years ago, who is most likely to ever have kind of a, a, an enemy relationship, or who's most likely to be a divorce, or who's most likely to not be speaking to each other? And some of those very same people, just in the last year of my life, Ethan, I've watched some things happen that surprised me. You kind of every time you see it, you ask the question, how did we get here? Do you see how big Dan was smiling over Stephanie? Now they're gonna have a great marriage and all of that, and it's gonna be awesome, but yes, the question, how could somebody who had that same hope, that same smile, barely stand to be in the room with somebody two kids later? And it happens, and there's all kinds of ways that it happens. I know there's compatibility, and I know that it's not always something that you can fix because it, it, it takes one to forgive, but it takes two to be reconciled. And I guess I want you to know that my goal today isn't to so much do an autopsy of anybody's mistakes, but just to show you something that happens. It, it, it always happens one offense at a time. Yes, there are betrayals, and yes, there's adultery, and yes, there's abuse. I'm not really talking about those big things so much today as I am what Jesus was talking about. He said, if you get something in your heart against your brother and sister, and then you nurse it and rehearse it long enough, it will literally create a smoldering garbage dump of fire in the very relationship that was once a garden of potential and love. How does this happen? It happens one offense at a time. How did we get here where we're smiling like everything is okay, but deep down in my heart, you know, when we come to church, man, nobody sees this stuff. When we come to church, watch this. Jesus says in verse 23, he says, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar and get it right with the person that it's not right with before you sing a song or pray a prayer to try to cover up the fact that your relationships are under attack. We were singing today in church this song, this beautiful worship song. Man, you should have seen the people singing it. And people had their hands lifted. Mercy is falling, falling. And that's what was coming out of some people's mouths. But if you could see what's going on in their heart, Jesus, it's possible for you to be doing something on an outward level, and at an inward level, you're full of anger and resentment. Mercy is falling, falling. 
except on my husband. He's a jerk. I'm in the presence of the Lord. If you could hear what was happening in the hearts of people, how, how do we get here? Jesus says, it starts small, but one offense at a time. The devil wants to tear Dan's heart from Stephanie's heart. You know, God takes the two and makes them one. The enemy takes the one and makes them two. How does he do it? One offense at a time. And God knows I need this message, man, because I'm not a perfect husband. I give 97% of the credit for the happiness that exists in my marriage to my wife. 3% is me. I'm pretty proud of that three. But if you put me in the wrong situation, I can get offended so quick. Just like on Twitter, there, there was one woman that went off on me, and I still remember what she said three years later. You know, thousands of people have said nice things to me, but I'm quick to find the offense. We can train ourselves to find the offense, and then just overreact, man. It starts off as raka, you, you fool. Next thing you know, I'm in living hell. And watch how bad it gets. Jesus said it can get so bad if you don't deal with it, if you don't learn how to deal with this, Dan, if you don't deal with the little things, the little foxes. He says if you don't settle matters quickly, verse 25, with your adversary who is taking you to court. Now, that confused me because in verse 21, we were talking about your brother or sister, right? We're talking about somebody you're close to. In verse 25, we're talking about your adversary. I always assume these are two different people. What if it's not? What if the same person who you called brother and sister in 21 is the same person who will be your enemy in 25 if you don't learn how to deal with offense? It happens. You ever thought about that? That the person who he says, the person who 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 doesn't deal with the offense, and it's interesting how he says it, if you don't settle matters quickly. That's so powerful. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who's taking you to court. Do, do what you can while you are still together on the way, or your adversary may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will not get out until you paid the last penny. The prison of offense. And it all started with Raqqa. It all started with Raqqa, the small offense. It all started in the parking lot. I was backing out, and this guy honking his horn at me in his pickup truck just a couple months ago. I took the boys to see that football movie, the Christian football movie. Okay? Wood, wood, woodlock, Woodlawn. We went and saw Woodlawn. It made a deep impression on me. We're leaving the movie, and, and, and this, this guy, he's hollering at me because his wife wants my parking spot. The problem with his wife wanting my parking spot is she has pulled up so close on my parking spot, I can't get out to give it to her. And now that's somehow my fault to this guy in the pickup truck. So he says to me, or offers a, a course of action to me, hey, get out of her way. She's waiting on your spot. And I'm like, and then I figure out that this is his wife because I'm putting it all together. And I rolled down my window and I said something back to him. <laughs> no, it wasn't any profanity or anything like that, but it was a rocker type thing that I said. Something about his wife's driving skills or something, you know, something like that, just something insinuate. But then he wants to get out of his truck. And he's not bigger than me. So now I gotta get out of my maxima. Because I got to. Because my boys are watching this, and I need to be a good example that if a man gets out of his pickup truck and, and challenges you, it doesn't matter whether you have an elevation sticker on your car, you gotta handle it. Why are you clapping for me? I'm so bewildered. And I got out and I said, What are we gonna do? Just a question. Just a question. 
It's just a question. And I don't know what happened next. I think to this day, I still don't know because his tone changed dramatically. I don't think he was intimidated by me. I think he realized who I was. I think so because it was right here in town. And so I think because I think he put the sticker and the all the thing together because all of a sudden he turned real spiritual. He was like, "Well, God bless you, man. We're just all trying to get where we're trying to go." And I was like, "Yeah, we are." And around this time, Graham comes out the car. He's eight, you know. He comes over and stands by me, and uh, he said, I, I, "You got your boys, and I got my wife." I said, "It's cool, man. We got over." He got back in the car, and I said, "When Graham got in the car, I said, Graham." I said, what were you going to do? And Graham said, I was going to kick him in the shin if I had to. And Elijah, my older son, he speaks up and says, Daddy, a better question is, what were you going to do? I said, whatever needed to be done, son. I hadn't thought that far about it. And he said, Well, think about it. I mean, let's say you get in a fight in the parking lot of the movie theater. Not only are the news people going to put you on, on the news, but they might not even, we might not even ever see you again. We're in the back of the car, and maybe they leave us, and then maybe you end up in prison, and maybe we don't have a dad. Did you think about that? And I said, that's right, son. I'm giving you an example of how not to handle a situation. And we went and ate some Mexican food. And here's why I told you that story. <laughs> when you are in these moments, I'm talking about not with somebody in the parking lot, I'm talking about somebody you love. You're not thinking through the fact that this is going to end up with me and you and an attorney sitting down talking about dividing our assets. That's not how division happens, because the enemy's agenda is destruction, his strategy is division, but his tactic is those little offenses. Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream, and share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.